The book of Romans, chapter 10, and number one, verse number one tonight, it's a familiar verse, and we're finally over to chapter 10 here, breaking some new ground, the book of Romans, and as I believe the Lord would have it, this verse came right on the day, on Independence Day weekend, and I think it's so apropos. And uh, I'm just reading one verse, so I won't even have you stand tonight. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. My heart's desire, it sounds like a perfume over at Belk's at the counter somewhere, doesn't it? But that's not what he's talking about at all. Is, or he's talking about my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, my nation, is that they might be saved. Psalm 37 is a good corresponding verse with that, verse 4. It says, delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. Paul certainly is a man who delighted himself in God's word and in God's ways. And he said, my heart's desire, the deepest aspiration the deepest desire I have is I want to see my country, Israel, I want to see them saved. They were not saved at this time. They had crucified the Savior, in fact. And they had rejected Paul and his ministry. He had been persecuted for the name of Christ. So this prayer would seem far-fetched if you measure it by the circumstances at that time. But Paul prayed the prayer anyhow. He prayed in faith, believing that Israel would be converted. Now, prophetically, the Bible teaches us that one day Israel will be completely saved. And we'll get to that over in chapter 11 and in following verses here. So this is a prayer for the conversion of his nation. The question tonight I have, this is a message of application almost completely. Can I say that my heart's desire for America is that she be saved? How many people in America tonight are praying diligently that they could honestly and truthfully say, my earnest desire, my greatest aspiration and dream would be that my country be saved? Number one tonight, I can tell you America's in desperate need. She needs to be saved. America needs to be saved. It was the day after the Supreme Court of the United States legalized gay marriage about a year and a half ago. And I heard a man say, I think it was on television or on the internet somewhere, I'm not sure where I picked it up, but he was a Christian leader and he made this, he made this statement. The culture war is over and we lost the culture war is over, and he said, we lost. I didn't really want to hear that. That just sounded so final and so negative to me. I didn't really want to hear that, but you know, in my heart of hearts, I thought there is a great element of truth in that. It's probably true what the man said. We've been fighting this culture war ever since I've been in the ministry, trying to turn America back to God, to moral sanity, to reverse Roe v. Wade, to reverse the prayer being eliminated from the schools and Bible reading from the schools and all those things. I, my whole ministry, I've been preaching on that. I've been hearing about that. I've always been involved in conservative causes, and, and we fought for that lobbied for that, voted for that, done everything we could, given money for it, and it hadn't happened. And this man said with such finality, the culture war is over and we lost. And I didn't want to hear it, but I had to admit it's probably true. My thoughts went to the book of Romans chapter 1 about my country. Turn back there with me. Chapter 1, as you know, describes the 
depraved state of paganism in the time of Paul there in the Roman Empire and throughout the world. And he talks about moral degradation. He talks about gross immorality, beginning with unthankfulness and moving through idolatry and all the various horrible sins there. And in verse number 24, he says about the people, the pagan world, he says, wherefore God gave them up. God gave them up. I go down to verse number 26. And for this cause, God gave them up. He repeats that phrase. I go to verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Strong, powerful, pungent phrases that Paul is using there. God gave these people up. He gave them up. He gave them over to this reprobate mind as he refers to it. The cause of God giving them up in Romans chapter 1 is gross immorality. Sin as black and deviant and perverted as the human mind and heart can imagine. And because of their gross immorality and evil, then God brought reprobation upon them. You see that word there, the last word, or you see it at the end of the phrase in verse 28. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You don't hear that word much today. That's more of a theological term. What is a reprobate mind? What is reprobation? Well, if you'll look that word up in the original languages, it means actually to not pass the test, to fail the test. God gave them up because they failed his test, whatever that may have been. Another definition of it, of a reprobate mind is to be debased. It was used when they took, dug ore from the ground and began to smelt it and heat it and make uh, some sort of ore out of it, whether it was iron or, or whether it was silver or gold, whatever it may be. And if the ore had too high a percentage of earth and not enough of the, of the metal itself, then they reprobated it. It was debased. They got rid of it. It had no value. So the word picture here is a very powerful word picture. God's word is saying to us that these civilizations of the pagan world came to such a diabolically evil level that Almighty God one day said, that's enough. I'm going to reprobate you. I've given you over to a reprobate man, to a debased man, to a man that is of no value because you have failed the test and you can't pass as the level of ore that I want you to be or that's required of you. And so this gross immorality is what made God give up on these ancient civilizations. And he gave up on a lot of them when you begin to study history and to look. He gave up on Sodom and Gomorrah. You know the story of that. He, he told Lot to pray, but he could not find enough righteous people that it merited sparing the city and giving grace to it. And then there was ancient Babylon. You remember the night that Belshazzar was having that orgy up there at the palace? And you remember that story? It was a vile, evil thing and gross immorality involved again. And suddenly a hand appears on the wall and begins to mysteriously write. Your days are numbered and within one hour of the writing of that hand, we're told that Cyrus's army came down through the dry riverbed. He had dried up the river upstream. And now he and his army marched down the riverbed, emptied of its water, under the walls of the city of Babylon and within an hour, he had completely conquered that great and ancient city because of their evil. I believe God judged them. Ancient Greece, where homosexuality and perversion were epidemic beyond anything that perhaps we even have in our culture today. Ancient Rome, known for its cruelty, its barbarism, its wickedness. And even ancient Israel, 
God's own people. You remember how that he said, under every green tree, you have erected an idol and you've turned from me. And over and over and over, the prophets are sent to Israel and they reject every one of the prophets. Each and every one of them are turned away. Not one of the one time did the prophets really have true national revival. And we come finally to where God says that's enough. The northern kingdom, God allowed the Assyrians to come down and to conquer them. And then the southern kingdom, God allowed Babylon to conquer them. And so there came a time when God gave them up. He gave them over to reprobation. He said, you're debased, you're so vile, so uh, wicked, so evil that I'm not going to be able to spare you and judgment will come. And so, is there hope tonight for America? You all have heard the story, it's so familiar, of Alexis de Tocqueville. He was a political science uh, genius from France. And he came as a young man, I think it was the 1830s, and he toured America. And he said, I've toured your country, and I've been in the factories, and I've been in the shops, and I've been in the banks, and I've been in your schools. I've been in every level of American life. And he said, it was not until I went into the churches that I found the secret of America's greatness. You remember that quote, don't you? It was when I went to the churches that I found the secret of America's greatness because there the pulpits literally flamed with righteousness. And then de Tocqueville said, America is great because she is good. And when she is no longer good, she will no longer be great. She will no longer be great. And the question is, is America good tonight? The question is, were the ancient nations that God judged for their wickedness any more wicked than America is tonight? We weren't living back then. We don't know all the details of what was happening in those ancient cultures, but how could they be more wicked than America is in many ways? If you, I don't want this to be a downer. I don't want this to be negative, but we have to deal with truth. We have to deal with reality. How could Rome or Greece or ancient Israel or those nations, how could they be more wicked than what we see in our own culture tonight? For example, we know that now for over 40 years, over one million children have been murdered in their mother's wombs. We're approaching now 60 million legalized abortions. We don't know how many illegal abortions are carried out, but we know we're approaching 60 million legalized abortions in America since Roe v. Wade was passed. Human trafficking is an exploding crime and, and, and evil in our world. And in America alone, 14,000 to 17,500 a year, between 14 and 17,500 per year, people go missing for the purposes of sexual and human trafficking. 80% of them are women, and of the 80%, 50% are children, little girls. And we hear about these things. A little child goes missing. We never find them. In all probability, in, those case, in most cases, they ended up being a victim of trafficking. They were sold. In fact, in many places in the world, this is an Internet statistic. I hope it's reliable. I'm not sure. But I read that you could buy a human being for $90. 17,500 of them or so come from America every single year. It's worse than some other places. And that, I'm not going to take the time and talk about the details of drugs and violence and murder and crime and corruption and all the wickedness that we know about. Of course, there's a spiritual deterioration. We did take the Bible out of the schools where we used to read it every day. Don't tell me that didn't have an influence. We did stop allowing people to pray to Almighty God in school. And 
today Christianity itself is, is under attack. All this silly diversity training we're having in the country today, when you boil it down, most of it is just an attack on Christian civilization. And so we live, can we honestly say that these other nations were more wicked than America is today? I was recently reading the book of Jeremiah. I just took my pen and underlined phrases as they began to jump out. I said, that might be a good sermon someday. And um, I'm not going to preach it as a sermon. It's just a little thought here. But in chapter 2, Jeremiah begins his 40-some-year ministry by saying, can a nation change her gods? And I underlined that. I said, yeah, I know one nation has changed her gods. And then I read over a few more chapters, and he said about God's house. He said, the priests have so deteriorated in their commitment to God's word that they've made my house a den of thieves. Jesus even quoted that over in the New Testament. That you go to the church and you get ripped off by the spiritual leadership of the country. And then he said, my people have not obeyed the voice of God. They received not correction, and truth has perished. And we've talked about that many times, haven't we? In fact, Isaiah embellished that thought a little bit and said, truth has perished in the streets. It's rubbish. We walk on it now. And I thought, yeah, and that's true of of our nation. After Jeremiah wrote that book of all the problems of the book of Jeremiah, he wrote another book that most people don't read too often. It's called the book of Lamentations. Would you turn there with me? It's between Jeremiah and Ezekiel in your Bible. And as the name would imply, this is a series of laments, laments. Jeremiah, the great prophet, preacher, man of God, is lamenting over the condition of the country because The book of Jeremiah, he wrote about what was happening in the nation. He kept calling them back to God. Lamentations was written when the city of Jerusalem fell. When Jerusalem would no longer exist, the the enemy had come in and taken the people away, and the city was now in dire straits. It was an awful, awful time in the life of the nation of Israel. And here's what Jeremiah sums up those times and with these words. Chapter number 3, verse number 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. What a great verse, huh? Couldn't we say that about our beloved nation tonight? It is the Lord's mercy that America has not been consumed. It is God's mercy purely because his compassions fail not. Verse 31, the Lord will not cast us off forever, said Jeremiah. Though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doeth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. And so Lamentations describes the fact that if it were not for God's mercy, we would already have been consumed. So is there any basis tonight for hope? When I asked the question this morning and I announced it here again this afternoon, is there any hope for America? Well, we ought to ask ourselves this question. I asked the question this way. Is there any basis for having hope? Is there a basis for hope? There are many people today think that the election of Donald Trump was going, they thought that it would turn the country around, that it was going to save us. And uh, I don't think Donald Trump can save America. Now, I don't want to talk about Donald Trump. That's not my subject tonight, and I'm not an authority on Donald Trump, though I like many things that he does, but then I turn around the next day and I don't like that so well. He's a flawed man. He's like Bill Monroe. He's a broken man. He's a sinful man. Donald Trump is not going to save America. For those of you who have one of those hats on it that says, make America great again, 
I hope we will, but he's not the Savior. And uh, some people think, well, if we get more conservatives on the Supreme Court, we've already seen a couple of good things that have come out of the con- just one more conservative being on the court. But I'm not depending on the Supreme Court for my future or you. If I were going to say anything could save us, I would say the greatness of the Constitution itself. Because it's kept us together for 241 years. It got us through the Civil War when brother went against brother. More people were killed in the Civil War, I don't know if you know that, than in all of our other wars combined. It was a bloody, bloody time. And the house was divided, and yet God somehow saw us through that and kept us one nation under God. But the Constitution is not going to save us. And one of the things that I think about often is, as de Tocqueville said, America is great because she's good, and when she's no longer good, she will no longer be great. And John Adams wrote this about the Constitution. He said, the Constitution was made for a moral and a religious people. Meaning if people are unrighteous and ungodly and wicked people, they're not going to honor the Constitution as it's been honored in the country for these many years. I think the key is in a one word over here, and we'll return again to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 9 and verse number 27. Romans 9 and 27, Paul said, I'm, My heart's desire and prayer to God for my people, Israel, is that they might be saved. And then over here later in chapter, or earlier in chapter 9, he had said, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, saying, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Mark that word remnant in your Bible. It's an important Bible concept, the principle of the remnant. God has always had a remnant. What is a remnant? You women who sew use the term a remnant. That's the little pieces that are left over when you cut the pattern out, if anybody knows what I'm still talking about. Do people sew anymore? (laughs) Well, the remnant... They used to have the remnant shop that sold leftovers from bolts of cloth that had been cut. A remnant is a a small percentage of what was a greater whole. A remnant is, is is a minority, if you will, a very small percentage. The Bible says, Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be like the sand of the sea, a remnant, a small percentage, a little group of them will be saved in spite of that. Turn to chapter 11. Paul likes this word remnant. He uses it a number of times. Chapter 11 and verse number 5. Even so at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. He again talks about the remnant according to God's election of these people to salvation, of course, in this context. It's not necessary for America to have a majority of the people truly be saved, born-again people in order for God to have mercy on his nation, according to my calculation here. There's another verse that's meant a lot to me through the years, and I've preached on it here more than once, Isaiah chapter 1. Turn there with me, if you will, Isaiah chapter 1, because Paul borrowed his thinking about The remnant, I believe, partially from the book of Isaiah. He picked it up from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter number 1 and verse 9, and I think this to be one of the most powerful, powerful verses. Isaiah 1 and 9, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, And we would have been like Gomorrah. He said if God hadn't left a little tiny minority of people, a little small percentage of righteous, godly people, then God would have judged Israel just like he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. He would have rained fire and brimstone on them, but he didn't. What was it that saved them? It was that small 
remnant, that righteous minority group of people that spared, their, that spared them from the justice of God. You remember the story of Sodom, don't you? It's been a long time since I've talked about it here. God said to Abraham, or Abraham said to God, won't you spare the city of Sodom? My nephew and his family and people that I know are over there. Lord, what would it take for you to spare the city of Sodom? And, and Abraham actually negotiates a little bit with God, the creator. If there be 50 righteous people, would you spare it? God says, yes, I will. Well, Abraham kind of screws up his boldness a little bit and says, I'm going to ask you again, Lord, what about for 40? And God said, yeah, I'll spare it for 40. And then 30. And then 20. And Abraham said, I got a pretty good thing going here. He's coming my way. Lord, one more time, I'm going to ask you. Would you spare the city of Sodom for 10 righteous people? And God says, I'll spare it for just 10. And stop and think a minute. Sodom and Gomorrah were huge cities, big cities of the ancient world. Principal cities, important cities. How many lived in Sodom? How many lived in Gomorrah? I don't know. 50,000? 100,000? I have no idea. A million? We don't know how many lived there. But they were significant cities. We know that. They're mentioned numerous times in the Bible. And if he could have found 10, just 10, God said, I'll spare the city. But he didn't find 10. Fire and brimstone rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Because God had a quota of righteous people in that society. And had that culture met the quota, God would have spared, would have shown mercy for the benefit, for the sake of righteous people. And they couldn't even find 10. And so judgment came. They couldn't even find 10. I've often thought, what if Lot had been a soul winner? He'd gone out and won 10 people to Christ, and he could have saved the whole country. You know what happened when he tried? He actually had that idea. Turn to Genesis chapter 19. It's a fascinating thing. At some point here, Lot, who is probably like the mayor or on the city council, he's an official, he sat in the gate, and that's what that meant, the official sat in the gate. Finally, he said, judgment is coming, and I've got to do something about it, and I've got to get my family out of here. I've at least got to salvage my own family. And so in, in Genesis chapter number 19 and verse number 14, he goes and he speaks to his sons-in-laws. Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, up, Get out of this place, for the Lord is going to destroy this city. And look at this sad phrase. He seemed as one that mocked to his sons-in-law. They laughed at him. They ridiculed him. They laughed in his face. What are you doing, old man, coming now and talking to us about Jesus and talking to us about God and judgment? You've been down here living it up with us. His testimony was so ineffective, he couldn't even witness to his own sons-in-law. But all he had to do was win 10 people. And he could have saved the nation. But hey, does that not give us an insight what might be the solution to this problem? Because it's not going to be the Democrat and Republican Party. It's not going to be the Supreme Court. It's not going to be the president. It's not going to be more people going to church. What is it going to be? What can we do? What is our role as members of the remnant? Because if you're one of God's children tonight and you're saved, you're in the remnant, the small group of people that are left in a culture when the culture is completely completely putrefied and deteriorated, and there's a little group of righteous people trying to hold the fort. So what is our role when that happens? Well, number one, I would submit to you our first role is to pray. 
You knew I was going to get to that, didn't you? Five minutes after I got into this message, you were probably sitting there saying, I know he's going to tell us we need to pray. I am. Why don't we? Why isn't America tonight having a great prayer meeting all over the country with tens of thousands of people in every community on their face begging God for his mercy and his grace and to spare America so that we can pass it on to our children and our grandchildren until Jesus comes. But we're not. We have the National Day of Prayer. It's a joke. I go down the courthouse and I got 38 people down there from the whole city or the whole county of Florence. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, one of our favorite verses. You know it by heart. You've heard me say it so many times. In Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, for without faith, it's impossible to please God. Period. Then it says, Hebrews chapter 11 and 6, that he that cometh to God, that's prayer, must believe that he is, that God exists, that there is a God, a creator God. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and say the next phrase with me, he is a rewarder of them that what? Seek him. People who get their prayers answered believe with all their heart in almighty God's existence but not just that he is out there as some deist believed, but that God hears and rewards those who come to him in faith. So why don't we pray more? It, all, it really has to logically come down to this. If you take the truth of that verse, we don't believe that praying will make any difference. We don't pray because we really don't believe that he does reward those who seek him enough to make it worth our time and while. This is logically where you've got to end up with that. But if we prayed, it could make a difference, I'll tell you. You've heard the story of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. And they were deadlocked. They were absolutely at loggerheads. There was dissension. They were at each other's throat. Every state, some of the states were threatening to walk out, particularly the southern states because the northern states were trying to pass laws against slavery and the southerners were raising cotton and, the, you know, that whole thing. And also there was a big debate going on about the, the um, number of representatives that they would have. And they were trying to figure out a big populated state like uh, New York at that time and a small state like South Carolina at that time, should they have equal representation? They worked it out finally with representatives based on population in the House and two senators, no matter the size of the state, like Rhode Island and so on. But before they had it all worked out, they were the loggerheads. They were fighting dissension, division going on in that room up there in Philadelphia. And 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin stood up with his spectacles on his nose, as they describe it, and he made a proposal. Gentlemen, I propose that prayers be held in this assembly every morning before we begin, and that a pastor from the city be present to officiate in that service. And you know they began to do that. And the division quieted. And in due time, we had our Constitution and we became the United States of America. Just one little story that tells you God hears and answers prayer. Now, he doesn't always do it the way we want it. He does it according to his plan. But he, it's a mystery of prayer. I, can't, I don't have time to preach a message on prayer. But God hears prayer. And when we believe that he rewards us for praying, then we pray. And God knows tonight we're desperate, aren't we? We're desperate. 
Oh, how we need the hand, the blessing, the grace of God upon our nation. Is there hope? There is if we pray. But if we had a billion dollars to spend on every other means and we don't pray, I don't know if there's any hope or not. Second thing, I think, is we must seek the salvation of souls. We must seriously, intentionally seek the salvation of souls. Let me ask you a question. God had a quota for Sodom. Could God have a quota for America? Is it possible that God looks over to an angel somewhere and says, go down there and count the righteous people in America. And if there be certain number of righteous people, I'm going to spare America. You think he would ever do that again? And so if there's any possibility of that, seeking the salvation of souls ought to be the the absolute heartbeat of every church and every Christian today in the United States. And the light of the gospel is dwindling. I talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago with our dear friend Junior Hill, and Junior's going to be back with us again this year in October. And Junior was lamenting the fact of how we don't have revivals, we don't have Sunday nights, we don't have Wednesday nights. Many places we don't have VBS. People don't go as often as they one time did. And our culture is not saturated with the gospel and with Bible truth like it was at one time. There was a reason they called South Carolina the Bible Belt across the South because it was literally saturated with, with gospel preaching and gospel knowledge by people and preachers and churches. The old gospel song, church twice on Sunday and once in the middle of the week. And those old time revivals when it hit its highest peak. And I remember when every church had a revival every spring and had a five-day revival every fall. And before I was born, they had two weeks in the spring and two weeks in the fall. Every night. And the, and the culture was saturated with the truth of God. No wonder America was a great country. And thirdly, I would say, what can we do? We can use the power of our influence because the smallest amount of light is more powerful than the greatest amount of darkness. And I can light one candle and hold it here and cut out every light in this building and you can see that candle. The small little candle will push back all the massive darkness of this room. And so it is in the spiritual realm. And so anything that I can do for the cause of Christ can move the ball down the field of progress. And so I vote, shame, shame on you if you call yourself a Christian and you don't vote when so many people died for that privilege. And we're not in the election season, so I can say it now, can't I? And I'm not politicking for anybody. But vote. That's using your influence, the influence that we all have. We can work for righteous causes. I know you have household duties and family duties and vocational duties and all that, but somehow or other, we have to be willing to make those sacrifices and to work for what I would call righteous causes. And out, when we leave here tonight and go out tomorrow, where, whatever we're doing in the work world, construction work or office work or, or medical work or educational work, whatever it may be, every conversation, we can somehow get truth in there. We can get light in there. We can give the tract. We can do small acts of kindness for people. We can change, we can't change America, but I can change my little world by the very spirit and the very attitude that I have. I can influence the people in my world. So is there any hope for America? Yes, there is. Because God has pulled nations back from the brink over and over and over. He's resuscitated what looked like was, was death. Is there hope? Yes, there is hope. But 
and it's a big B-U-T. But there's not hope until America changes course. We must change course because right now we're heading for the abyss. Turn with me the book of Psalms and another great thing of principle here. Psalm number 78 and verse number 7. Psalm 78 and 7. What a wonderful verse. I just discovered this a few weeks ago, and I've just seen it over and over and thank the Lord for it. I've never noticed the verse before. Psalm 78 and 7. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Is there hope? The verse says it, doesn't it? It says that they might set their hope in God, in God coming to our aid and delivering our nation, and that we not forget his works, and we not forget to keep his commandments to live according to his word. Tonight, tonight, I'm not only a proud uh, citizen of the United States, I'm a proud citizen of the state of South Carolina. Are you tonight? Do you know what the motto of our state is? The motto of our state is a Latin phrase, dum spiro sparrow. And in Latin, that means while I breathe, I hope. While I breathe, I hope. That's true for us tonight, isn't it? We won't give up hope on our country. But oh, how we need God to visit it. And as long as we have breath, we hope in God. We keep his commandments. We remember his works, what he's done before. We pray. We seek the salvation of lost people. And we use every bit of influence we have to change not the whole world, not even the whole nation, but the world around us, the little world that I live in. I can be the salt and I can be the light. And so tonight, my heart's desire and prayer to God for America is that we might be saved. Stand to your feet with me, if you will, please.